if you were going to decide ever to memorize an entire book of the Bible, or an entire chapter from the book, because memorizing an entire book would be an incredible feat, but if you were going to memorize one chapter, Colossians chapter 3 is a great candidate, okay? It, it, there is a lot contained in it. Uh, when it comes to just the depth of what it means to be a Christian, the hope that we have, practical examples as to what we're supposed to think about and how we're, how we're supposed to live are summarized in Colossians 3 very, very well. Now, as we saw in Colossians 1, he tried to, Paul goes in Colossians 1 and tries to summarize like the entire Bible. All right? Well, in Colossians chapter 3, it's a, it's a very beautiful synopsis of the Christian life. You're all familiar with what DNA does, right? You know that every protein in your body was specified by your genetic code. You have four billion base pairs, and they code for every single protein and the fats and everything as well because it's called post-translational modification. But everything, everything about you physically was encoded in your genetic program. What has happened when you accepted Christ is that that program, your, your spiritual DNA, if you will, has been rewritten. It's like this. If you take a look at a plot of dirt that's a square, let's say it's eight feet by eight feet, and it's just dirt. You call that a plot of dirt. It's just land. Now, if you take it and you put buds or seeds in that land, you instantly transform it into a garden. But if you look at it three days later, the dirt and the garden look identical. In time, with sunlight and water and so forth, you see everything sprout, so it's recognizable as a garden. But the question is, when did it become a garden? It became a garden when you planted the seeds. That's like us is that when we accepted Christ, the power of our own sinful natures was decapitated. Okay? It's still there. It can still talk, but it can't force us to do stuff anymore. Our futures were forever changed, but we've been, a seed has been planted. God's own spirit has now come inside of us and turned us into something different. Our, our, our spiritual DNA has been rewritten, and we have divine code now, which allows us to be different right now. So, Colossians chapter 3, starting with verse 1. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth, for you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. Now, I read this passage many, many times, many times, and it, it, it just didn't register. The imagery is kind of difficult. What do you mean I died and I'm going to be raised with Christ? Are you to me, that sounds like you're talking about in the by and by, hundreds of years from now when I'm dead. What does that have to do with right now? Because you start out telling me, set my sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Think about the things of heaven. Okay, you tell me right now, think about the things of heaven, but when all this transformation takes place, that's way in the future when I'm dead. So since in the future I'm going to be raised with Christ and I'm going to share in his glory, I should think about heaven now? Is that what it's saying? It does seem to be saying that. It says that, you know, if you, if you realize that your eternal life has already started, though, it's saying something different. It's like eternal life doesn't start when you die. It already started. The power to live differently has been put inside of you now. So in view of that, it says in view of that, okay, set your sights on that. You are a transformed creature, and that trans the ability to live a transformed life has already begun. Think about that. When C.S. Lewis was a professor at Magdalen College, and he first started to write books as a Christian, okay? because he wasn't famous for Christianity. I mean, he was a scholar. He taught in the English department there. He, he was could in read Latin, Greek. I mean, the guy was fluent in multiple languages. And he, he'd read all these classic works in the original languages and do critiques on them. And then he uh, started writing Christian works. He, he got the idea uh, for, um, the first was The Problem of Pain. He wrote The Problem of Pain, and that gave him some fame. And um, the radio, BBC, uh, asked him to do a series of talks on the radio for the soldiers at first, and then they said, "Well, let's let's well." Yeah, but, but then they said, "Let's um let's do it for the whole country." And so he started. That's where Mere Christianity came from because of a series of talks he did on the BBC during World War II. Because at that time, 
German, or, or England was very disheartened because they were getting bombed by Germany and everything, and people, people were really uh, very frustrated and upset. The country was very um, distressed because they just did a World War I. Okay, because World War II was actually an extension of World War I. They were already burned out from war. And now here's another one. And so, like, where is God? And that's why they, they wanted C.S. Lewis to encourage the country because people were so disheartened. Where is God in this? My gosh, another war? Is this ever going to end? And so that's when he did that. And then uh, he also, while he was doing those, he, he wrote screw tape letters. And so he's writing all this Christian material. So the president of the college, who was his friend and also a fellow Christian, called him into the office and told him that his Christian writings were getting him in trouble, that his colleagues were not allowing him any advancement. He was up for chair of the department, and he was shot down as chair because his colleagues absolutely hated him because he's doing all this. He says, says, we'll allow you to be a Christian, fine, but to promote it, that is unacceptable. He says, says that your writings and your promotion of Christianity, he said, it is beneath you and beneath the dignity of this college. Now, what does it mean when somebody says something is beneath you? It means that it's lower than than what you what you are. Yeah. It's like if you if you were a doctor, excuse me, Mm -hmm. and you became a garbage man, Mm -hmm. that job technically is below you. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. So in a sense, in a sense, it's a compliment by saying, you know, you are you are above this. You are a much you, you are much more accomplished. A much more noble than the task that you are doing. Okay. Now, the president of the college obviously was wrong. <laughs> I mean, that was the best thing C.S. Lewis. I mean, that's that's what you know. I mean, I've been, now looking back, obviously uh, it wasn't beneath him. It was some of the best stuff he ever did. Um, but that, but the term was used inappropriately in that particular case. Here, what we have is God telling us that um, that the the the, the, re- the real heaven is where we really are that ultimately it's not just ultimately that is our position we are we're we're almost there i mean keep keep in mind what you are becoming you are not just a seed you're the whole corn stalk and of ultimately that will be manifested but you're not a piece of dirt anymore okay let me go on all right, now this is, that first one was the New Living Translation. This is the Message Translation. So if you're serious about living this new resurrection life with Christ, act like it. Pursue the things over which Christ presides. Don't shuffle along, eyes to the ground. Absorb with the things right in front of you. Look up and be alert to what's going on around Christ. That's where the action is. See things from his perspective. Your old life is dead. Your new life, which is your real life, even, even though invisible to spectators is with Christ in God, he is your life. When Christ, your real life, remember, shows up again on this earth, you'll show up too, the real you, the glorious you. Meanwhile, be content with obscurity like Christ. So the imagery, again, the gestalt here, the overwhelming imagery is you're a superhero. I mean, you are incredible. You're shining. You have awesome abilities now. You are, you are a different creature and you know, focusing on the things of this earth is far beneath you. That's what it's, it's easy, you know, because things don't change right away. It's easy to think that if this is the same old, same old, but it's not. You are, you have become something different. The things of this world are still there, but they are much less. Considering what you are now, you know, God has given you new clothes. He has exchanged your dirty, your dirty clothes with His perfect robes. And again, in a hundred years, you are going to look more like Christ than you're going to look like you. So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Now, sinful nature is still there. It's been decapitated, but it can still talk. Okay? It doesn't have the power to corrupt you completely and destroy you like it did before, but it can still speak. And <clears throat> unfortunately, our free wills are still intact. Many years, as a young Christian in the early years, I used to wish so bad. says, Lord, just take my free will. Come on, I'm giving it to you. <laughs> okay, take it because I'm really screwing it up bad here. <laughs> All right, All right. I, need, I need to not have free will because with my free will, I make a lot of bad choices. Okay, and Paul talked about that same thing in Romans chapter 7. He says, the thing I don't want to do, I do it. The thing I'm supposed to do, I'm not doing. It's like, oh, this is terrible. You know, who's going to save me from this? Okay? 
And every Christian has experienced this at times. It still talks, and we give in. And here we have him saying, okay, I have a responsibility. God is telling me, okay, you need to do something. Put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. How do I do that? How do you put to death your sinful nature? I mean, it doesn't have power, but it does influence. It has, it has influence. Right? How do I put, what I, how does that happen? Yeah. Okay, to pray, to, to not depend completely on yourself, but to ask God for help. Yes. Read scripture, you say? Mm-hmm. Yes. How does that help? Well, it's, it's just a matter of what you put into your mind. Okay, and you're actively programming. Is it uh, Dennis Waitley that says <clears throat> that you dwell in the current inmost cavern of thoughts? Yeah, okay. Good point. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. It does give a specific direction as to how to change it. It does. Yes. Yeah. This is kind of the same thing. Resist. Put to death. Resist. Fight him. We have to fight him. I mean, why can't this be autopilot? No, we got to do stuff. Okay. Yeah. Well. All right, and this is the, the next verse. Okay, first one said, first one just said, put to death sinful earthly things lurking within you. And this right here is the, this is, no, this is not the next verse. This is the same verse through the message says, and that means killing off everything connected with that way of death, sexual promiscuity, impurity, lust, doing whatever you feel like whenever you feel like it, and grabbing whatever attracts your fancy. That's a life shaped by things and feelings instead of by God. It's because of this kind of thing that God's about to explode in anger. Right. You guys, we're all right. It is important that we say no to it, that we we ask God for help, that we pray about when we read scripture. Um, There are other things, though, too, and that is it's about making provision for it. There are, I've I've said this several times before, for modern believers and ancient believers as well, what trips us up? What keeps us immature the most? Two things. One is addiction, because we're, we are very prone to instant gratification. We like our immediate gratification. It comes through drugs, through alcohol, sex, through food, you name it. We like our instant gratification, and we cross lines all the time for that. So addiction, number one. Number two is our ability to forgive and lack thereof. <laughs> okay, is how we treat other people. We like to hang on to our grudges. We like to think about revenge. We don't let go of slights very easily. Those are the two biggest areas. If you've got both of those under control, if you can love your neighbor as yourself and you forgive readily and completely and you don't have any addictions, you should be teaching this class, okay? Because you are way better than me, okay? Because those are the two areas. And when you are growing, these are the areas that you get better at. In other words, you, do, you are able to forgive more and your addictions drag you down less. Okay. Yeah. That forgiveness really is, to use your analogy from before, is that hot torch that you carry around yourself. It absolutely is. It is. It is. And it has the same impact. Um, resentment is an acid that will burn and destroy any vessel that holds it. If you hold it, it's getting you. It literally, it literally, actually it's a source of neuroinflammation. It's actually degrading your brain. I mean, it actually is. Negative emotion is horrible for you, okay? And that's a big one. All right, so kill it off. Um, when, with regard to addiction, you know, if somebody, for example, I have a patient, um, oh gosh, there was one guy just what, Friday, and his addiction was ecstasy. It's very rare that somebody's addicted to ecstasy. It's so destructive. I mean, we know that it causes massive brain damage. The thing is, is that when you have an addiction, if you're serious about putting it to death, you need to lose some phone numbers and stop calling some people. Stop. There are certain people you need to stop hanging out with. Okay. If it's a porn addiction, then you need to cancel some subscriptions. If it's an alcohol problem, you need to get it out of your house. I mean, the bottom line is that if you're serious, if we're serious about growing, then putting to death the sinful nature it means stop feeding it. If you stumble occasionally, God's okay. I mean, he'll forgive you. But if you don't try, 
if you like keep the stuff around and don't make any and don't make any changes, then that's a problem. 